All right, last time we looked at um, basic introduction to JavaScript. We talked first of all about the purpose of JavaScript, and then we looked at uh, a simple example. And even though it's a simple example, it sort of illustrates why we have JavaScript and, and, and starts to talk about the capabilities that exist within JavaScript. Um, the idea of JavaScript is that we can make small changes to the web page without going back to the server. That's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, why is that good? Well, there's a little interactivity to the page. Um, for example, with the ESPN, the, um, the um, uh, what, what do I want to say, the uh, uh, drop down on menus. By doing that, um, you can uh, get more content on a page, right? Because you're not showing all the content at the same time. You can show and hide contact, and that's a, that's a good, efficient way of, of making use of space. All right, so for example, the example I'm talking about, go to ESPN.com. over there, the different things appear. Um, there's not enough room on the page to have all that stuff showing all the time. So they hide it until you ask for it. And you don't ask for it from the server, right, because that would take time. Again, it, it might happen quickly in terms of the computer's time, but it would take a few seconds. And depending on the internet speed that you had and so on, it could be a little bit bothersome. With this, you get an immediate response because actually the code to do this has been sent down with the HTML. So part of the HTML uh, um, is shown, part of it is hidden. Um, what is also loaded is the code that controls when to show it and when to hide it. All right, and this is that kind of code, that kind of interactivity is done via JavaScript. It's client-side scripting. It doesn't require traveling through the internet to access the server. And it's a win-win situation because the user gets a quick, immediate response, and the um, the um, uh, server isn't burdened by these small little requests. Let let the client take care of it. So the example that we went over last time was this. We had a little spoilers page where you could show it or hide it. If we look at the code for this, all three languages that come into play have their role. All right, HTML is all the content, whether it's shown or hidden. All the content is in the HTML. So, for example, in this case, the paragraph that says Luke's father is is in the HTML. The span that shows the spoiler is in the HTML. The button that you click on to show it, the button that you click on and hide. All that content is in the HTML. CSS is used to sort of set the initial display, how the page displays initially. All right. So initially we show it with the spoilers being hidden. Uh, in the ESPN example, all those menus initially are hidden. All right. And one way to make them hidden is to say display none. And that's what we do here. Now where does the JavaScript come into? The JavaScript comes into the interactivity portion of this. And by interactivity, I mean that the user does something and the page responds. And the page responds without going back to the server. So in this case, there's a snippet of JavaScript on both the show and the hide button. Let's make it a little bit smaller so we can see the whole line of code. Starts with an on click, both of them. Remember, JavaScript, there's a user event. User event is an attribute of an HTML element. In this case, we have an on click event that says, hey, when this button is clicked, this is a JavaScript that I want you to do. And what do we have? We have document. 
Get element by ID, loop father, style, display, inline. All right. A few things to notice about this. First of all, it's case sensitive. In other words, this all needs to be this case. If I made a D in display, if I made an S in style, if I made uh, the I in ID lowercase, if I didn't have the cases of those correct, then it, then it wouldn't work. All right? So JavaScript is very unforgiving in that sense. Um, this expression, oops, this part of it is known as a DOM expression. A DOM is, a, is what's called a document object model. And a document object model is simply a, one, a way, and there, there can be several ways to do it, to reference the individual things on the page. To be able to say, I want to do this to this certain link. Or maybe in more advanced JavaScript, I want to do this to every link on the page. All right? Would be another example. <coughs> in this case, though, the way the DOM works is I start and I narrow it down what it is about the, the page I want to do something with. And again, this is a piece at a time. And each piece gets narrower and narrower until we're finally pointing at the one thing on the page that we want to change. So, document means it's on the page. All right? And again, a lot of times it's going to be document, the first part of this. Um, but it is possible to change things in another window that you pop up. If my program popped up a window, um, then we could change that. So it's not always going to be document. But in this case, it's on this page, so it starts with document. Dot, get, element, get element by ID. Then it's kind of going to be the workhorse of our discussion about JavaScript anyhow, because what it does, it allows you to point to one specific thing on the page. Remember, ID, identification, means it identifies one thing on the page. Just like your student ID. No other student has your student ID number or your student ID. Your student ID card uniquely identifies you. So no two people have the same student ID card. Well, Get element by ID will allow you to find the specific thing on the page, the one thing on the page, because you should not have duplicate IDs within a HTML document. So in this case, I'm looking for the thing called Luke Father. So what on the page has an ID of Luke Father? This span does. Which initially, because it has a class of spoiler, is invisible but we're going to override that. What is it about Luke Father that we want to change? The thing on this page that has an ID of Luke Father, we want to change its style. Well, what about the style, right? Style could be a whole bunch of things. It could be the background color. It could be the, um, you know, who knows? It could be all, all sorts of different things. Well, we want to change the display property. And what's the display property, uh, what do we want to set it to? Well, we want to set it to inline. All right? Now, it sometimes it's confusing um, what you enclose in quotes and what you don't. Anything that's like a name of something or an ID, you're going to enclose that in quotes. All right? Document get element by ID, that's a command. You don't include the commands in quotes. What's enclosed in quotes is what are called in programs literals. In other words, I want exactly that. I want exactly the letters Luke Father to match the ID. I want to set the value of the display property to the word inline. Not some variable, for those of you that have worked with variables before, but the, the, the literal letters inline. And notice that we use two different kinds of quotes in this. We have a double quote that goes around everything, the whole JavaScript statement, and then within the double quotes, I use single quotes. That way, it, the browser won't get confused, like what quote belongs to what. The single quotes match the single quotes, the double quotes match the double quotes. And the browser does not get confused at all, as if I tried to use double quotes everywhere. All right. The... the Code to hide the spoiler is virtually the same. All right? 
document get element by ID, Luke father, style, display equal none. All right, so it does the actual reverse. It sets the style back to none. All right, we talked about this last time. Um, and um, we said that if we wanted to do more stuff, we could, we could do this pretty easily. And sort of the brute force way to do this would be to simply copy this code. Let's make another Star Wars spoiler. about this button, the show spoiler. I want to show this spoiler. So what would I need to change about this line? Just the ID. Right? Everything else is the same. It's on the page. I want the thing on the page that has a certain ID. I want to change its style to inline. The only difference is I don't want to do that to Luke Father. I want to do that to Leah Brother. And same thing with this. So I can save that. And show it. Hide it. Show. And hide. And I'm in business. All right? Is, is. Correct that. Same thing again for one more, one more spoiler. It's really not much for spoiler. Anything terribly wrong. It's not that hard to do, 
But if you copy and paste and do stuff like that, you're liable to paste wrong. You're liable to forget a, a, a quotation mark or uh, forget to change something or whatever. All right? So instead of that, what I want to do, and, and, and what if I wanted to do something else when I hit a spoiler? Maybe I wanted, maybe I wanted to change the color of something in addition to showing the spoiler. What if I wanted more stuff that I wanted to do? Well, um, I can fix that by using what are called functions. And functions are simply a, a section of code that you're going to repeat over and over and over again. All right? That you might use in a bunch of different places. The whole idea of not reinventing the wheel. So I'm going to introduce functions to you. It may not look like a big deal, but it actually is when things get more complicated. All right? If you've used, it, if you've used Excel, you've used functions, right? You just haven't written any functions in Excel. Probably not anyhow. What's a function? It's a, it's, it's a set of statements or it's a set of instructions that do a certain task. So that all you have to do when you want to use that function and perform that task is just give it a few parameters. For example, one of my favorite functions, when I teach 121, I always go over this, is the payment function. Does anyone remember the payment function from Excel? Who'd you guys have for 121? <laughs> uh, the payment function allows you to calculate the, like a loan payment. So if I had a payment that was 5% interest and I borrowed $15,000 and it was for 36 months, how many, uh, how many, uh, you know, how, how much would the payment be? How much would the monthly payment be? All right. Now, in order to call that, you have to give the, the function what it needs to do its job, right? I can't just say, what's my car payment going to be? And it's going to come out with a value, right? You have to define the parameters of your car payment, which, again, are what? Well, how long the loan is for? You know, are the payments monthly? How often do you make payments? What's the interest rate? And how much did you borrow? All right? I think, I think those are all the things that you'd have to need to define to calculate the payment. And if you supply that to the payment function, it does its job, and it calculates the payment, and it tells you that, you know, your payment will be $556 a month or whatever. All right? What we're going to do now is we're going to write functions, and we're going to use them. So we're going to write functions that do a particular task, and then we're going to use those functions to make our life easier. And again, in this example, eh, it makes it a little bit easier, but when you get to more advanced examples, it's going to make it a lot more uh, noticeable. All right. So, let's write a function to do this. I'm going to go up into the head section again, and I'm going to use a different tag that, that we've seen be, than we've seen before, and it's a script tag. And the script tag is sort of like the style tag, right? The script tag tells the browser what you have here is some JavaScript. Just like the style tag tells the browser what you have here is some CSS code. So the style and the CSS, or the style and the script tag, both tell the browsers, hey, the stuff that's between the start and end tag here is not plain old HTML. It's JavaScript or it's CSS code. Okay. The way you declare a function is you declare a function like this. You say the word function. It has to be lowercase. You give the function a name. So I'm going to create two functions. I'm going to say hi, or I'm going to say show, spoiler, and it's going to accept an argument. All right, what's an argument? An argument is sort of the parameters. In other words, if I were to say show the spoiler, what does a function need to know to do its job? Well, which spoiler do I want to show? All right, do I want to show the first spoiler, the second spoiler, or the third spoiler? So I have to supply 
the spoiler that I want to show. Likewise, if I'm going to write a function that says hide spoiler, I have to supply an argument for which spoiler I want to hide. Just like if I tell Excel, calculate my car payment, I have to tell that function, well, how much did I borrow? What's my percent interest? How many payments am I making? For how long is the loan? And so on and so forth. I have to give those parameters for it to do its job. I can't just say, give me my car payment and have it figure it out. You got to tell the function what it needs to know to do the job. Well, same thing here. I can't just say, show the spoiler. I have to say which spoiler I want to show. And we're going to put which spoiler we want to show in what's called a variable. A variable is simply a place in the computer's memory that you're giving a name to. And you can refer to that name later on. And I'm going to call that an argument because that's what you typically say. The, the, the parameters that you give to a, a function so that the function can do its job, those are called arguments. All right. So my function is going to look like this. Cut all this code out. Now, do I always want to show the Luke Father spoiler? No. I sometimes want to show Luke Father. Sometimes I want to show Leah's sister or Leah's brother. Sometimes I want to show who shot first. But whatever thing I want to show is going to be in this variable argument. Arg. All right. Now, that's a variable, and variables you don't put in quotes. So how does this work now? Well, on click, instead of having that whole long line, I simply say, show spoiler, and then in parentheses, I say Luke Father. So when I click that button, it's going to call my function, which, again, is only one line of code, but it could be multiple lines of code. And I'm telling it to do that function using this as a parameter or argument. So the value, Luke Father, gets plugged in this variable. So arg has a value of Luke Father. So I say, find a thing on the page that has an ID that is contained in the variable arg. Well, if I pass called it with Luke Father, it's going to have the value of Luke Father. And then change the style, make the display inline. So, I'm going to do that for all of the shows. Now, the only thing that's going to be different between these is the argument. Because I'm doing the same exact thing each time, right? When I show a spoiler, I'm doing the same thing each time. The only difference is, is I'm doing it to a different span, to a different ID. So here I'm doing show spoiler, Leah brother, show spoiler, time shoot. Now, guess what? I'm going to do the same thing for... Hi, spoiler. And then because we only have like one line of code. But still, it's a good habit to get into. Because we could be doing other things in our function.
So now, when I do this, it's going to have the same impact. All right. But instead of having the code, that long line is part of the on-click event. I have a neat, concise little function that simply says, well, do I want to show the spoiler or hide it? And which spoiler do I want to show? So I call this function up here. And boom, it either calls this, it calls that. It's going to take the value in argument. It's going to plug it in here. It's going to find the thing that has that ID. And it's either going to show it or hide it. So show spoiler, hide spoiler. Show spoiler, hide spoiler, show spoiler, hide spoiler. It works the same way. Now, here's one way that it comes in handy. Let's say, let's pretend that this is a big line, that, that there's a whole bunch of lines of code here. All right? If I make a mistake in one, if I use an uppercase D instead of a lowercase D, guess what? Nothing is going to work. Well, Gee, that's not good, right? But the good news is, is to fix it, I only have to fix it in one place. So, for example, let's say I type this in and I said on click equals document get element by ID, blah, 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 blah. And I used a wrong spelling or I used the wrong case for a letter. And I copy that code over three or four times. If I discover my error, I'd have to go and fix it three or four times. Whereas here... I only have to fix it in the one place, in the function. So I'm going to save it, refresh, show spoiler, doesn't work. This one doesn't work. This one doesn't work. Oh, what's wrong? Well, again, we don't want to stare at our code. We want to do some troubleshooting. And if I click on that, click on more tools, developer tools, and look at console, I can see that Document get element by ID is not a function. Well, hmm. I thought get element by ID was a function. And what did I say if you think something is right but it isn't? Well, one of the first things you want to do is check the case. And so I could go and Google and look it up or in a book or whatever and say, oh, it's get element by ID. So, all I have to do to fix it is fix that line of code in one place. Boom. And then all of them are fixed. All right? So that's advantage of functions. If you want to change the function or if you have to correct an error in the function or whatever, all the code is in one place. The only thing you're doing is you're calling a function. And remember that sometimes you're going to have more than one line of code. All right? Sometimes you're going to have multiple lines of code. All right. Any questions about this one before we move on to our next example? All right, our next example, keep in mind, is that, that we can change anything we want to about the page. All right. And I'm going to go and I'm just going to, for the heck of it, just play around and, and make, uh, make uh, a, a web page that has a few different things on it, and we're going to just play around changing stuff on it. So let me go and let me save this as example. And I'm going to just put some Greek text in here. I have a paragraph of Greek text I'm going to put in my 
little document here. Make a low count contrast style. And a high contrast style. Why might I do this? Well, I might think the high contrast looks cooler and looks sleeker and, and sort of fits our company image better. But there's some people that might have a hard time viewing the, the low contrast. All right? I actually know a, a website that did this. They, they thought that it looked better with the low contrast, but they recognized that some people might be, for a variety of different vision problems, not able to, to read the low contrast as well. So they made a high contrast version. So I'm going to put, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say background white. Color, I want to make it a very light shade of gray. So I'm going to make it pound sign D, 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 D. And I'm going to make my high contrast style background of white. A color of black. So let's see what this looks like originally. Remember, the CSS is going to say what it originally looks like. Then I'm going to write JavaScript to go and change this. All right. It's a little hard to read, right? Yeah, maybe I think that looks good, though. So maybe I'll go with that. I'll, I'll make it a little less lighter because that is pretty extreme. There we go. That's readable. But for people that have certain eye issues, maybe that's not so readable. All right. So I might give the user the ability to customize this and change it from high contrast to low contrast. So I'm going to put a couple buttons in here. Actually, I'll create one button to start with. Change to high contrast. On click. We call a function that's called change to high contrast. And so, what my function is going to say is that's a nice thing to copy and paste it so you don't get a typo. Say function I need an ID on this. Dot 
class name equals higher contrast. I have a typo in there that I'll go back and fix. All right. Change the high contrast. I click it, got a higher contrast. Now, how would I make it change the lower contrast? All the same way. Make a button. Change the high contrast, change it to lower contrast. So you're giving the user the ability to sort of customize the page uh, in a way that they want to. Um, now, you can easily resize the text with the browser, but you can also do it via JavaScript. So what if I wanted to make a high, um, a, a large print version or a small print version? I could do that too. All right? So... Change to large font. Document get element by ID, intro text, style, dot font size. And make it 2M. Let me initialize the size to 1M. A large font. All right. We could then change it to low font. to, in one click, change it to high contrast, large font. I could do this. I can make a button. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. 
I have a function that changes it to high contrast. I have a function that changes it to large font. I am going to simply use those functions. Functions, the idea of functions is you write the code once and you use it wherever you need to. So, I'm going to call the function to change it to high contrast. And then I'm going to change it to large font. Now notice that I don't have this line of code duplicated. Right? I'm just calling the function because I've defined what it means to change it to high contrast. So I never have to define those instructions again. I can simply, um, whenever I want to do that, whenever I want to change it to high contrast, I can just call that function. Whether I want to change it to high contrast and large font, or high contrast and low small font, or whatever, I can simply use those functions. So now, I have Makes it like that. So I could put this on my site and I could say, you know, this is a regular standard version of the site. If you're visually impaired, click this. And it would make it larger font and, and, and all that. And again, I could do any variation of this. I could change the font style. I could change any number of things. Now, a couple things I want to notice. I want you to notice is, let's go back to the Star Wars one. I want to look at both of these side by side. Notice that in the style, in the Star Wars one, I have display none. How do I point to that? Document get element by ID. Style matches that. Display matches that. And then I change it. Instead of a colon, I have an equal sign. <clears throat> this line of code is the same thing as this. Right? Both of them are setting the display to none. One is within the CSS code. One is within JavaScript code. But it's the same property. There's only one display property for an item on a page. And that's called display. And again, it's spelled the same way. Now, in this example, notice that font size, normally in CSS, font size is font dash size. So whenever you have a property that has a dash in it, you eliminate the dashes and make the first letter of each uh, subsequent word after the first capitalized. So instead of font dash size, I have font size with S being capitalized. And that would be the same thing if I change the border from border type dotted to border type solid. All right? Which I can do. Right? I could write JavaScript to change the border on this. All right? I can change anything that I can set via CSS. I can change via JavaScript. And I use virtually the same syntax with just a couple of twists here and there. Yes? If you have an um, external CSS sheet with the same code. Same thing works, yeah. The only reason I'm putting this in the uh, in, uh, same file is just to make it easier to, to talk about. But yeah, um, if, you had a, if you had CSS, uh, an external file would work exactly the same. Yes? If you had something set in JavaScript like a font size and you also had something set in the CSS that was a different font size, what would it pick? Well, remember the JavaScript, the initial load of the page, there, there's two things here. There's the initial load, then, then there's the user action. The initial load is going to be the CSS, all right, with rare exceptions. You could write JavaScript to override that. But generally speaking, the JavaScript that you write is based on some user's action. So in the kind of JavaScript we're doing, the CSS would initially apply, 
and then the JavaScript would take over when, I, when the user did the action that triggers it. In this case, when the user clicks the button. So I could write code that as soon as the page loaded, it changed it, the JavaScript changed it from this to that, but probably typically wouldn't do that. All right, what I want to do is just show you a preview of some of the things we're going to look at next week. Uh, because one of the, um, you know, your assignment is to take and sort of duplicate or emulate some of the code that I have uh, going to provide as examples. So I just want to give you a preview of some of the things that we are going to look at next week so that you can take some time and study them in advance. Well, no one laughed when I made that suggestion, so that's a good sign. so that you can view them. This one are some zoo pictures. And this one is a real simplified version of the ESPN menu thing. Zoo pictures work like this. I have thumbnails, and as I click on the image, the thumbnail, it shows the bigger image that corresponds. It's a nice way, again, to make a good use of space, right? Someone might not want to look at every individual picture. So you have thumbnails, you have smaller versions of the picture that people can go through and look. All right. So that's one example that we'll look at next time. The other example is uh, our menu example, and that looks like this. A little different than the ESPN one. I can click and show or hide, and then I can have links. Menu 2 is based on a mouse over. Um, this one, social sciences and sciences are off a little bit, but we can take a look at that. So we'll look at these two examples next time. But they all work on the same principle. User action, JavaScript code, code points to something on the page that does something, and, and then makes some changes to the style or to the HTML. All right, we'll see you over in the lab.